I often wonder, how do they choose what to put in a game like Civilization VI, or perhaps even a cheeky Civilization VII in the near future? With all of these different game modes added to Civilization VI, some 45, nearly 50 strong roster of historical leaders, the game is incredibly diverse and complex. And in a recent presentation delivered by somebody from Firaxis called Anton Stringer, called A Historical Accuracy, bringing new myths and representation to civilization. He shared a lot of detail about the new frontier pass, how they designed it, some secrets along the way, and some insights into what went into it, how it was developed, and specifically how they chose the leaders and civilizations to put in Civ 6. Without any further ado, let's delve in and talk a little bit about what they discussed. Like the video just down there next to the end turn button, and we'll roll straight through into the video. I should also note that this video is based on this presentation. I'll be sharing the information that they shared and trying to keep it to that as much as I possibly can. Now, while the second half of the presentation was purely focused on the New Frontier Pass, the first half talked about these three theories that underpinned the development of the pass. So it would be unfair for me not to mention them. I'm happy to discuss them further in a future video, but in this video, I'd like to keep them fairly short and brief so that we can get to the juicy details around choosing civs and leaders. You can see them on your screen already, but essentially there are three sort of myths that underlie the development here, myths of developing civs. The first is that progress is always inevitable. History has perhaps proven it not to be. The second is the great man theory, the, the social theory uh, being that great men are overrepresented for drama or for avatars or for the sort of greatest hits mentality, whereas actually monumental ages and roles were, were played out by various people. Uh, often histories under the great man theory tend to favor a more sort of dubious famous winner rather than acknowledging perhaps a general more broader societal context that underpins single leaders. And lastly, the what if history theory, uh, that history is a series of choices and chances and that sometimes historical games can reach through into that choice and chance element to explore how history could have been, uh, to give uh, perhaps more of an interesting nuanced experience to a player as an option. This is, of course, is risky as well because it can lead to uh, accurate or inaccurate feelings by the players and potentially strive or stretch too far. Those are the theories that underpin the design and some of the upsides and downsides to them. Important context to have in your back of the mind as to how they're thinking when they design and implement civilizations. Now, let's talk about that, shall we? Adding new leaders to a game uh, they describe as, as being something that's very difficult. Difficult to first select one, uh, research it make sure that it's accurate, make sure that it represents what it needs to represent. They offer essentially four pillars that help them decide where, how, and what to pick and what to implement and add to the game. Uh, these are firstly chronology. Where does the person or culture come from throughout history? And that's time. The second is geography. We don't want everybody coming from the same house on the same street. Ideally, we'd be stretching across a few different continents. Thirdly is the role of gender. They'd ideally like to have some representation for women and men in the game. And lastly, play styles. So what historical persona, personality does this person, this character have? Uh, for example, we don't want all militaristic leaders, they say, in a game that really should have others as well. Perhaps, and I'm theory crafting here, scientists, explorers, religious leaders, uh, geopolitical leaders. There's more than just the war stick, although the war stick is probably in the player's perception, I imagine, very important for a game like Civilization VI or indeed any of the other additions to the Civilization franchise. So those are the pillars that they offered for deciding. But there's more to it than that. It's not just a simple checkbox. More information was offered. They also look to both familiarity and fresh faces. The idea being that they offer up the familiarity, those uh, leaders that players really relate to, whether it's because they're a meme like Gandhi or because they're historically significant like Gandhi. You can see there are lots of different uh, motivations at play. And of course, it's trying to 
strike that really careful balance between giving players what they want, what they're used to, but also providing something that is fresh and new. Because if you repackage the same thing again and again, I imagine that's also unlikely to please all players. Uh, lastly, the thing that they also noted here that I thought was a, a quite an interesting, more sort of back end comment was that also there are some practical considerations around voice actors. They always use a real uh, native speaking voice actor to play these roles. So sometimes there are limitations around that and other things they mentioned as well, including, you know, where those people are, what equipment they have available, actors, uh, their anthropologists and in-house researchers, what their expertise lies in and what they can access, things like that, that might get in the way or help or hinder certain characters in history. For example, if you're a leader that was buried deep in history books because maybe you lost a fight a few thousand years ago, you might be more difficult to surface. Things like that. The example that they gave, they gave a few, but the, one of the examples that they gave was Simon Bolivar, the what if Grand Colombia leader. Perhaps not the first leader that one might reach to when they look at that region, but also likely far from the last. A leader also that incorporated one other thing that they talked about in this section, and that was that they also wanted to try and bring different histories in. And this sort of touches on something that I've just mentioned. And what I mean specifically by this is that it shouldn't always be the victor. Uh, and the thing that they note is not that they should go back necessarily and find the worst people in history. It's not about good versus evil, but rather victor versus oppressor. So there may be leaders in history who fought against the oppression of a people, the enslavement of a people, but ultimately lost that fight. That was the specific example that they drew on. But I acknowledge that there's probably some murkiness here around who decides what. And in similar videos like this that I've made before, that's often something that comes up, that there's sort of a judgment call underneath this that's being made. The impression that I got about that specific concern was firstly that it wasn't really the scope of this presentation. It wasn't commented on specifically, but more broadly, the idea was we want to highlight people who have fought against oppression and tried to stand up for their people rather than going back and saying, this leader hasn't been represented and they were really awful. Let's put them in. I think that's what they're going for. That was just my take. I will have the presentation, by the way, linked below if you'd like to watch it yourself and get your own take. I'm going to try and keep this video fairly factual, so I'll refrain from giving too many of my takes like I said at the start. But if you'd like to check it out yourself, and I would recommend that you do, it's linked below. Moving along, that's the setup for how leaders are chosen, or at least some of the elements that go into it. It's important to note, of course, as I mentioned at the start of this video, that this discussion was about the New Frontier Pass, not about designing a base game and a base sieve. And I think that that's something else that could potentially be missed here. So it's important just to note that. And really, this is uh, stressed a little bit more in the second part of this video, the kind of uh, bit that went alongside the addition of the extra leaders. Because of course, it's not just extra leaders that they're choosing, they're choosing extra civs, cultures, and then releasing those along with potentially a free update, but almost always alongside additional game modes, game qualifiers, game systems as well. So don't forget that these leaders aren't added in isolation. They're also added within an existing system and they're being added in alongside supporting systems as well, which makes them equally as important. You see, the addition of modular systems through the New Frontier Pass was also a marked change from previous DLCs. And rightly or wrongly, and we do have to consider some timing around the release and what the world was doing, but as they rightly point out in their presentation, the New Frontier Pass was the most successful Civilization VI DLC release of all time. The question, therefore, is why? Again, it could have been to do with the release period and everybody being stuck at home, but the design philosophy of the New Frontier Pass, as pointed out in the presentation, was more about des uh, designing in line with players, taking on player feedback. They surveyed very broadly. They wanted to release six paid and then six free updates over the course of nearly one calendar year between May 20th and May 21st to keep players engaged, to increase the number of active players, and thirdly, to test these myths. Again, as I mentioned, 
at the start of the video, the presentation was all about bringing new myths and representation to civilization. And the New Frontier Pass is obviously the perfect testing ground and case study for that. And one that they argue turned out to be a fairly successful, in fact, the most successful one of all time, despite Civilization VI being some four or five years old. It somehow managed to outperform even the first two initial DLC releases that released, you know, within the first sort of two or four years of the game, particularly actually that earlier phase around year two and then year three. So it's quite impressive that the New Frontier Pass was able to do that. But of course, there are lots of variables, so I won't delve too much more into that, other than to say that really modular systems are the second underpinning for the New Frontier Pass. They liken them, and I like this analogy a lot, and I hope that you do too, to ice cream toppings. What does that mean? Well, we have a base game. Civilization VI, with some DLC and expansions added onto it, adding extra features like the natural wonders, for example, the disasters, loads of great things that were added into the game as core features. Then we have the ice cream toppings. You've already got your scoop of vanilla, maybe a scoop of chocolate as well, if you're feeling particularly plain and adventurous today. And now you're adding your toppings on top. That's the extra game modes that New Frontier Pass added. That's the extra leaders that the new Frontier Pass added, and specifically here, the modular systems. And there are a couple of really great examples of how these modular systems, these pieces, can be added on top of games, individual playthroughs that you or I might play through, but also the broader franchise and everything that already exists within it, all the leaders, all the modes, all the maps, etc. And how these different modular systems, these pieces, can be shifted around to create entirely new, or at least somewhat more random experiences, again, adding more intrigue. Not only is it interesting to have a modular system like, let's use secret societies as an example, added into the game, but then how does that system interact with the one that was added in the last update? How will it interact with the one that's added in the next update? How does it play out with all of the existing civs? You see, it opens up a lot more opportunity when you add the modularity on top rather than forcing it into a system that, or a game that, in this case, may have already been generally considered to be quote-unquote finished, right? The base game is done. Let's add the ice cream toppings on top. Secret Societies is a great example of this, and also leading back to that testing myths, that idea that history is perhaps also about the what if, or at least history games are. Of course, there's always going to be an element of randomness and creativity in these experiences. Otherwise, you'd be reading a book with words already written. So then if we are engaging in a little bit of what if history, where a series of choices and chances can play out with a historical grounding, at least somewhat still based in it, i.e. historical leaders that are somewhat accurate feeling to who they were, or player-driven narratives as well. They particularly benefit from this randomness and something that I personally really enjoy about games like Civ or Humankind, or of course something much more engaged on this front like Crusader Kings 3, where we have the ability to tell our own stories. And here they argue as well that history isn't just a 4X to paint the map, to push other people away, but actually there's an element of storytelling that goes on around that. The secret societies, of course, also bleeds into that a little more when you think about how there are powerful entities outside of the player's control. These powerful entities that we don't have direct control over necessarily as the player, but we can, as you'll see me do in this video, bring the secret societies into our fold, or at least attempt to join them. But there is that area of uncertainty to it. There are also later diplomatic consequences that come from joining a secret society, potentially. These are elements of slight randomness, slight chaos, and things that are slightly outside of the player's control. They also aren't 100% historically accurate, built Building on that myths and legends, that representation, that new myth, that new myth that Anton talks about so readily, I should note, by the way, that Anton has some 10 years of development at Firaxis, working right the way up to lead designer, but also fitting the role of designer, programmer. He talks a lot in the presentation about how at Firaxis they're fairly fluid with their job positions. One minute they're programming, next minute they're theory crafting and designing, and then they're back programming it again, a very sort of hands-on approach to different stages of development rather than a more segmented fractured system. 
However, of course, let's also remember they're a big company doing a lot of things. The new Frontier Bus was incredibly detailed. And to counter that point, he also talked a little bit in the presentation about how uh, somebody could be working on one piece of this pass and then somebody else could be working on a very different piece releasing months later. So yes, it's uh, concrete and together, but also fragmentation and difficulties there as well, I think. Or at least that's the lessons I could gleam out of the presentation. Lastly, on the modular systems uh, thing, there are actually two more pretty good examples that I think stress not only how the new Frontier Pass was designed, but also how we might start to think about how we could use this as inspiration or how Firaxis may be using these design lessons as inspiration for their next release, whatever it may be. I've still got my fingers crossed and my toes and eyeballs for a Civilization 7 announcement this year. We are getting closer towards announcement season starting in June and moving its way through, so who knows what we could see. The first was the Bermuda Triangle in Civilization 6. Again, not really a real thing but also has a social connotation to it, a role in history, myths and legends. I'm sure many people would perhaps even believe it to this day. The Bermuda Triangle in Civilization VI essentially operates as a one-way teleport on the map, a natural wonder that a ship could go into, receive a movement bonus for the rest of the game as a result, and be teleported somewhere randomly across the map. Again, it adds to that player storytelling. It tests the role of myths and history, and a, a little bit, and to a certain extent, builds on that what if history. In fact, a little bit would be an understatement. What if the Bermuda Triangle were real? What if it does exist? Is essentially what that is testing, and doing it in a really interesting way. I'm sure you can think of many things in the New Frontier Pass that fit this design philosophy that fit for Axis's most recent design philosophy, because let's not forget that's what this is. The new Frontier Pass came out just a little over a year ago. It is the last content release that we've seen from Firaxis in the Civilization franchise. So if anything is going to encourage or lead or inspire future inspiration for a development of a Civ 7 or whatever the next release will be, because you can beat your backside, there will be one series is unlikely to just be drying up as we speak, <laughs> although as time ticks on, no, 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 the series is alive and well, and I think that there are probably some lessons that we could take from what we've discussed today as we conclude and think ahead to what civilization might hold for us. First and foremost, let's think about exactly what we've covered. So we know that the design philosophy behind the new Frontier Pass, the most recent content release for Civilization VI, the most recent DLC that Firaxis have produced of any kind, was sort of featured around three goals, around attracting players, around engaging with players, keeping them engaged and interested in interacting with the community so that they could get better value and feedback from them, among many other things. And of course, lastly, to test those myths, to test the what if history, the randomness, that slight element of chaos and unpredictability that was added to the game through testing those three myths that we talked about at the start, that progress is always inevitable. It is not. Look at Dark Ages, look at Rome. The great man theory. Are there other roles that we could introduce? Not just talking about adding female leadership into the game, but much more broader than that around the broader institutions or organizations or societal pressure that underpins great change throughout history. And of course, what if Gilgamesh were a space fan? Or oh, that fantasy element that does have a role in a game like Civilization, the extent to which, though, is of course up to you. Ultimately, I think that we should expect these design principles to be tested when a baseline is established. That was also another key finding from the presentation. Don't forget, the new Frontier Pass was an extra, an addition. There must still be a baseline. There must still be, and they acknowledge this, the role of familiarity, the role of the greatest hits, the drama that comes from having someone like Gandhi, Khan, Queen Elizabeth, Washington, these familiar names to a franchise and you'll have familiar names for you as well. But of course, you'll also have familiar names for your own lived experience, just like I do personally. And again, not to get too personal in this video, I love seeing New Zealand in a game. 
It really warms my heart. I'm from New Zealand and I like to see me in some way. It's cool. It's fun. And I can see why that would be fun and appealing to all players across the world too. Thank you very much for watching. If you'd like some more discussion like this, I could happily provide it on the first part of the presentation, which was so interesting too. But other than that, I will end this video here. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.